All right. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Jason Jones with the Community Technical Assistance Center, and I would like to welcome you to today's webinar, Toxic Masculinity and Clinical Practice with Men. Before we get started, I want to take a moment to orient everyone to the WebEx system so you know how to participate in today's event. Please note that upon joining the webinar, you've been placed on mute to avoid any background noises that may distract others from listening to the presentation. If you come across any technical issues during today's event, please chat to the host who will be able to assist you. You will have the opportunity to submit questions to the Q&A portion of today's presentation by utilizing the chat box feature, which is located on the right-hand side of your screen. If it isn't visible, click the dialog bubble on the top right toolbar and it should appear. In order to ensure that we are able to answer as many questions as time permits, we are requesting that you send in your questions at any point during the webinar, and we will address them during the Q&A portion of today's presentation. With that, we are very excited to have with us today Dr. Matt Engler-Carlson, Professor in the Department of Counseling and Co-Director of the Center for Boys and Men at California State University Fullerton. Once again, thank you for joining us, and I will now pass it along to Dr. Engler-Carlson. Take it away. Thank you, Jason, for the introduction, and I also want to thank um, NYU and the Silver School of Social Work for putting on this webinar. Um, I think it's a great topic, and it's a real honor to speak with everyone here today from wherever everyone is. Um, in terms of thinking about um, we're, what we're going to talk about, I think there's a lot of information we're going to address, and um, in terms of my background and experience, um, I spent a lot of time working in different settings, whether it's university counseling centers, school-based mental health or community practice. Um, I do a fair amount of consulting with, with men as well. Um, and what I've noticed is that a lot of people haven't had a lot of exposure to, to some of the science and some of the research about men and masculinity, um, but they do have a lot of experiences working with, with men in their practice. And so part of what today is about is kind of taking some of those experiences and taking some of the ideas that are floating out there and trying to kind of bring them together in a way that kind of helps guide what you're doing so your work with men is a lot, lot more successful. So when we look at the, the agenda today, um, it's pretty broad, and I, um, I do notice that often when I do talks like this, people say, what should clinical people be doing when they work with men and tell them tell me what to do? And, and I actually don't think it's that easy. I think that if you really want to help men in and help men become healthier in their lives, then you really have to have a broader understanding in terms of what masculinity kind of means. And then from that, you can begin to understand a bit more about this intersection of, of, of one's idea of masculinity and, and their, their health overall, but also their, their mental health. Um, and then look at kind of how that intersection impacts the way that, that we as helping professionals help engage men in, in, in clinical practice. And I think that if, if we do that, um, you'll have a much more nuanced understanding of understanding men and, and how to help them. And so I'm also aware that, that even though the topic is really focused on toxic masculinity, you're going to see is that I'm going to kind of address that um, in a broader way and work through the kind of idea of what is to toxic masculinity and move in, in kind of a different place around that. Um, so before we get started, we're going to start with a quiz. And uh, so the quiz is up here, and the quiz is kind of how much – actual training have you had on the psychology of men? Great. So everyone should see the poll appear at the right-hand side of their screen. Um, you can expand it by clicking on the arrow, but we'll give everyone a few seconds to respond. 
Okay, so I think the poll has kind of ended, and so um, what I kind of see is kind of kind of what I usually see is that is that you know the majority of people um, have really had no experience to this at all. That say is really the first time that they've kind of maybe learned about the psychology of men, or even even that it's it's kind of a field. A few um, about twenty four percent of you had read some type type of scholarly articles or had one lecture or so. A few more took a CE workshop, which is great, and then about four percent have had had a lot of extensive training and experience. And I, I think what what that means is that when we look at the psychology of men, it it isn't something that that's commonly taught. You know, unless you've had um, maybe uh, undergrad degree or classes in kind of gender studies, um, that there's really rarely that you'd have a psychology of gender class in a grad program. And usually, what people have is is some type of lecture maybe in like a multicultural counseling course um, in which the conversation is gender. Um, but we also know that for the most part, when we look at um, our textbooks, gender usually doesn't mean men. It's usually an understanding of girls and women and their, their experiences. And so very few people have actually had exposure to kind of, kind of psychology of men and the fact that it's a, um, there's in, in about 40 to 45 years of, of really solid empirical research about how we understand men's lives, and we're beginning to kind of find ways to filter that, that out for people. And so, um, um, so, okay, so when we begin to kind of think about what does masculinity kind of mean, you know, we go back to that poll question earlier about what exposure have you kind of had directly. Um, your experience in many ways often mirrors men themselves. Um, and this idea that we don't necessarily kind of have a lot of conversations about what masculinity means. So I'm going to ask you kind of two questions to chat about. One is kind of, what does masculinity or being a man mean to you? Um, and then two, how did you come to that understanding? Like, how do you know that to be? So this kind of question, what it means, means to be a man, um, and I'm, I'm beginning to see some of, some of the, the comments here. Um, for, for a lot of men, it's not something that, that, that they talk about that often. And when I talk to, to men, or even when I talk, talk to my students, I kind of say, you know, how often have you, you had conversations about um, being a man, um, unless they've maybe been in a men's group in some capacity or had some, some direct experience, usually um, what being a man is is something that, that you, they just kind of know, that it's something that they kind of do um, with little to, to, to no reflection. Um, um, but yet it's all around us all, all the time. Um, and we do learn this from a variety of places. We know that it comes from us from kind of media, it comes from us from um, our parents, from our friends, social, social influences. There's a lot of different ideas in terms of what it mean, means to be a man. Um, and again, how did you come to that understanding? Um, it might be um, that when male clients come to see you, it may be one of the first times, if you ask this kind of question, what does it mean to be a man, maybe one of the first times that they've actually had a chance to sit down and say, I don't know, let's talk about that. You know? um, so like I said earlier, it's something that we often don't overtly talk about or think about, but it certainly organizes our lives, and we perform our lives and for many of our behaviors based on that, on that idea. So let me move to this question in terms of kind of, so what exactly is, is masculinity? And you notice that I, I crossed out masculinity and wrote down masculinities. Um, and this question itself is, is, is more difficult than it appears. I've been on panels before in which that's the question and, and people can argue and talk about for two hours about what it means to be a man and what is masculinity. 
And we often end up with no really, really set definition. Um, um, and what you notice that there's been kind of a big change, this notion that rather there being one form of masculinity, now we see masculinities with this IES. The notion around that is that one's gender identity is really the product of different relations and behaviors rather than a fixed set of identities and attributes, and that's related to the context in which one survives. So that means that there's an idea of multiple masculinities, right? And your masculine identity will be shaped by class, race, culture, sexuality, all different types of identities in, in terms of that, in, in terms of the intersectionality of, of that. What we do know is that regardless of how you make sense of what it means to be a man, there's often some competition with one another as to who can claim or which can claim to be the most authentic. Um, we also know that male masculinity is also constructed consistent with one's own reference group. So the idea is, is that men and, and boys and adolescent males have an idea in terms of who they believe they ought to be in order to be a man. We kind of live our, live our lives trying, trying to live up to, up, up to that. And yeah, like I said, masculinity itself is often quite confusing. It's a lot of different things. So before you, you see a lot, of, a lot of different images, you know, and this actually reflects a lot of the, the chat question um, from just a moment ago in terms of, of what it means to be a man. And these are often the common kind of things that are put out there, right, which is this notion that, that men are strong and tough. And so when I talk to adolescent uh, males, I can say, what does it mean to be a man? I say the first thing I hear is tough. Um, so we see that there's kind of a toughness in the, in the upper left corner. There's kind of a stoicism as well, right? You kind of see in the, in the bottom right, right? This idea that, that men are stoic. Um, they're often kind of in control, right? They're, they're self-assured. Um, they're somewhat unemotional in a way and, and they're ready for action, right? Um, and that's kind of some of the more dominant notions about how, what it means to be a man. But we also have to be fully aware that that's a really incomplete picture, right? Um, because this is also what it means means to be a man, right? And if we, we look at these photos here too, we see other things, which is there's recognition that that boys and men, you know, have a full range of experiences, identities, and, and emotional behaviors and thoughts, right? So one of the things that I often do when um, I teach is I, I put up a lot of photos and I ask people to kind of say, when you see these photos, what do you, what do you see, right? Because we do have a lot of preconceived notions in terms of, of what it means to be a man, right? And we may not always see some other things as well. So like an upper left photo, when I see, see these adolescents, what I see is a lot of intensity. I see a lot of sweat. I see this notion of brotherhood and, and connectiveness. When I go to the right, I, I see, um, um, actually that, that photo is, is of an adolescent father and it's from, from a book on that. And what I see again is I see a guy with a Superman tattoo, right? Um, and yet he's holding a son in, in a really tender kind of way. We see men as fathers, right, in the bottom. And we also see this other notion around men in terms of kind of experiencing a lot of distress, right? Here's obviously a picture of, of a soldier. Um, you don't know what he experienced, but you look at where he is, and he looks like he's pretty ragged, right? Um, and in many ways, when we think about what it means to be a man, it's, it's all of that, right? When we look at some of the research, what we're also aware of is this notion that one sense of identity, right, has a bit to do with the striving to always be a man. Um, there's two researchers, Jandell and Boston from University of South Florida, who are social psychologists. They talk about masculinity as being um, precarious, and this notion that manhood is a precarious social state that is hard won and easily lost, that requires constant and continual demonstrations of proof. So what they're saying here is that, you know, as men kind of strive to kind of, kind of live up to the notions of masculinity, right, it's a hard fought kind of thing. And, they're, and when they get that identity state, they can also be, be knocked off quickly, right? And when we think about this, we often think about um, how we learn to be men um, and kind of when do men kind of really experience these notions of really trying um, to perform? And we know that often happens out of adolescence, late adolescence, early adulthood, right? Um, and that men are always trying to perform this aspect of, of, of who they are. Um, and yet a lot of men, again, are really um, 
um, insecure with who they are as a man. But what is really clear, of course, is that um, this notion that, that who you are as a man matters a lot to men, right? That men are invested in, in defining and living in accordance to the required understanding of masculinity. Right? So what that means is that when we, we think about men and think about gender in general, it is an organizing function in our lives, right? Um, and these gender stereotypes are often quite universal. Um, research suggests that, that the gender stereotypes become pretty entrenched before the age of 10. Um, we also realize that kind of how you perceive girls and boys is actually socially driven, not biologically driven, right? Um, so we go to this first kind of idea that, that men are invested in finding and living in accordance with the required understanding of masculinity, and they often experience conflicts when their actual life and reactions do not match it. So what that speaks to is this notion of what's called gender role conflict. In psychology of men and masculinity, gender role conflict is probably the most studied phenomenon. Um, it comes out of uh, the lab of, of James O'Neill at the University of, of Connecticut. There's probably close to 300 studies that talk about this. And, and O'Neill's gender role conflict paradigm suggests this, is that when, when males begin to figure out what it, what it means to be, be a man, um, they're aware that there are some dominant ideas in terms of what it means. And these are kind of more of these stereotypical types of things. Men should be tough, men should be stoic, men should be independent. Um, and men learn that when they act that way, right, um, that the boys around them, right, um, acquiesce, right, and that you're part of the group, right? Uh, and it, so if you can act upon that way, you're okay. But if you violate those norms in some way, there's often some type of penalty for doing so. So I can talk about this in some ways is that men often learn what it means to be a man in boyhood, right? And it's, and it's actually pummeled into them. What I mean by that is that it often is, is pummeled into them. My experiences of growing up as, as a boy in, in the Midwest, I can think of a lot of experiences in which I had conflicts, right? Which I was aware of kind of what I was supposed to do as, as a man, right? But my actual experiences were quite different. So I can remember an experience when I was playing baseball, um, and I was a catcher, and I got hit by a bat, right? And what I was aware of is this extreme amount of pain. I had tears in my eyes. All the boys came up to me and said, Matt, 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 are you okay? And my response, you know, with tears in my eyes, was that I'm okay. I have a stand in my eyes, right? And the boys around me then would say something to the effect of, oh, that's okay. Why don't you walk it off, right? So we enter into to, to a bit of collusion around this, is that the expectation is that, Boys don't cry, men don't cry, men don't show emotions, right? Um, and if they, in particular, tender emotions, as long as I play along with that, the boys are playing along with me as well, and I'm okay, right? Um, if I would have done something else, which I would have kind of began to kind of cry and, and say, you know, get my mom, I need some help, the reality is, is that probably most of my friends would have been like, huh, you know, and they may have called me a name of some type, right? And I would have been kind of rejected around that. When we think about these kinds of experiences um, in our lives in which men experience these, these conflicts, right? Because no sense of masculinity, again, when we think about this idea of kind of being in power, being in control, taking charge, being independent, not showing emotion, um, they're actually virtually impossible to do all the time. Um, men are not robots. We're human beings, and we have human reactions to things, right? But men learn that when they kind of show these human reactions, there's a penalty. So a lot of men learn to overconform, right? Kind of not your emotions at all, right? But the reality is, is that they do feel emotions and that's the actual conflict. So that was a bit of a long, long description there about what is gender role conflict, but it's helpful to realize that that's often um, an experience that, that a lot of men have that they're not aware of, um, but they feel it and it does impact their mental health. Um, the second point here is that masculinities, right, one's male identity helps men drive a sense of meaning and identity and can serve as a measuring point or, or comparison point. So what I mean by that is that um, when we ask men in terms of what it means to be a man and how they understand that and how, um, how they feel about themselves as a man, they can begin to give you some, some internal assessment, right? 
Um, and it can serve as a really good point to begin to investigate in terms of kind of how their experiences are and their well-being. We also know that, that masculinity is very, very real to men, right? So when we think about gender identity in, in general, like I said, um, we all have different identities, right? And it has a bit to do with terms of what we find salient. Um, and they're also intersectional in the sense that we may have aspects of racial identity, we might, we might have gender identity, sexual orientation. Um, but gender for a lot of men is really important for all people um, because it's all, gender is one of those things that we often see first, right? Um, and when we begin to have conversations about what it means to be a man, right? Again, you can have pretty rich conversations about how men see themselves, both in terms of who um, they are, but also who they want to be. So one of the aspects around, around masculinity is to kind of look at this notion, kind of this present notion and this aspirational um, idea of, of, of who he wants to be. The other part that I think is really important here is that we do a lot of research on, on assessing masculinity, and there's a lot of different scales out there that, that you can take. Um, the BEM sexual inventory is one, the general conflict scale is one, the male, male uh, norms uh, is one. And if we look at across all, all, all of these measures, right, I've, um, what we find out is that most guys actually score in the middle. Um, it doesn't really matter how we measure, most guys score to the close of middle. So most men are middling masculinity, right? But the research also tells us that most guys think they're not as masculine as other guys they know. We also know that most guys don't think they're as masculine as they ought to be. So in other words, a typical guy thinks he ought to be a lot, a lot more masculine. He's likely to believe that he's the least masculine guy in the group. So from that perspective, it's not a surprise that guys make an effort to prove their masculinity again and again. Um, and that it doesn't take much prodding to kind of try to prove it, even when it involves something kind of risky and stupid. So when I think about that, I think about, you know, when I go into a space and other men are there, this notion that men begin to kind of size each other up and make an assessment. And again, if we have the knowledge that most men are probably in, in the middle, but most men are trying to, to aspire to a different kind of expectation or norm, um, it's really hard to get guys to begin, begin to talk about themselves. So I think about this idea of like, men's group, and I'm not sure how many people on the call do men's groups. I have a fair amount of experience doing that. What I notice in, in a lot of men's groups is that the first time you sit down, a lot of men just kind of look around at each other. Um, and a lot of men are really hesitant to kind of talk about kind of who they are. But there'll be some point relatively soon um, in which, in a way, the guys will stop posing and the guys will stop pretending and they'll begin to kind of be aware that most men are probably more like than they are different. Um, and when they do, right, that's when the real group begins, right? And so I often find that as a really helpful kind of way is that though we have these stereotypes of what men are, men are supposed to be, most men are not those, those actual stereotypes. We also have this notion, of course, that, that masculinity is, is, is is changing as it always has. We know that men and gender norms have routinely adapted to culture and time times around them. Um, the perception, of course, is that, that many men cannot or have not kind of changed. Um, but we know that there are changes, right? There are changes based on how society organizes itself. There's a lot of changes in terms of kind of, of women's roles, right? And then men's roles, of course, have to, have to respond, respond to that. At the same time, while things are kind of changing, this notion of of the policing of masculinity is a constant which makes it hard to figure out. Um, and it's hard for men to figure that out as well. And so one of the things you may have noticed in the past six months is that there's been a fair amount of conversation in, in the popular press about, about masculinity and health, whether it, it, it was the Gillette ad that came out, whether it was the, uh, the APA guidelines um, for boys and men, but every single and a kind of national media source, an international media source, had some article that talked about, about, about masculinity. And often that article really kind of looked at this interplay between kind of have things kind of changed, have, have they not. And there's often a thread of, of this policing notion around here, right? Which the policing notion is that 
is that it's constant when you figure out kind of who they're supposed to be when there's when there's stereotypes and there's forces around that kind of say you need to be a certain way. Which this notion that it's it's really there's not a power for men to conform gender stereotypes around that. There's often penalties when they, when they do not. Um, which leads us to the, this question of toxic masculinity. Masculinities, and um, and I can start by saying that I usually don't talk a lot about about toxic masculinities. Um, it's not something that um, um, really comes from scholarly sources, um, and you, you don't find a lot of it in in academic work. Um, but the notion itself is probably about yeah, it began about the early, about the mid '70s or so. Um, regardless of not if I see it in in, in kind of kind of scholarly sources, it's something that comes up a lot in, in, in the popular press. I find that my students are asking me more about it. It's terminology that people are beginning to use. So I think that if we, if we do want to successfully work, work with, with male clients, we need to understand a bit about what it is and what it, what it is not. Um, so in many ways, toxic masculinity is this notion that describes the type of masculinity that encourages, that kind of gives legitimacy to misogyny, homophobia, and sexual violence, right? It involves dominating others, particularly women, and means resolving disputes with kind of aggression, physical conflict, anger, and, and exhibiting kind of, a, kind of a, an aggressive masculinity. Um, that's one definition. Another way of thinking about, about toxic masculinity is this notion that it's, it's often a case of masculine beliefs producing behavior that's ill-suited for the particular context, right? Um, so in, in that way, toxic masculinity is the mismatch of, of an element or an aspect of, ma of masculinity with the context in which the behavior is being exhibited. So let's look at this idea of, of kind of aggression and anger, right? So there are places in society where being aggressive and angry is probably more appropriate in places where it's not. Um, so again, if you're in an athletic event or a sport, being aggressive, of course, and, and is, 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 is valued, right? Um, in the workplace, most likely not, right? And so um, it's, again, this understanding that, that toxicity is, is in, in some ways, it's toxic for the man himself, and we'll talk about that in a second, but it's particularly toxic for, um, for those around him, right? So it has kind of this, this externalizing effect. Um, one of the difficulties with this notion of toxic masculinity is that it often gets confused with this other kind of notion, which is which is traditional masculinity or, or traditional masculinity ideology. Um, and, and they're not always, always the same. Um, I think that the toxic masculinity we talk about often is kind of this headline grabbing stuff, um, which is often the interpersonal kind of type. This is the Harvey Weinstein and the, um, um, and yet when we look at kind of traditional masculine ideology, what, what that is is this notion that it's a particular constellation of standards that have kind of held, held sway over a large segment of the population. And again, this includes this anti-femininity, kind of achievement, um, not showing weakness, and, and kind of this notion of adventure risk and, 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 and violence. Um, much of the research on the psychology of masculinities has looked at this notion of, of traditional masculine ideology. And what the research really clearly, clearly kind of says um, is that when men kind of adopt these, these traditional kind of notions in, in a rigid manner, right, um, what we end up kind of finding is that um, that rigidity is strongly related to nearly, nearly, uh, to nearly every form of psychological distress. Um, so we know that men who are high in what we call this gender role conflict, right, are also least likely to seek flight psychological treatment. In a sense, their masculinity is kind of a straitjacket for them. And it moves them into this, this realm of toxic masculinity because if you're a straitjacket in terms of how you display yourself and show yourself and what you can do, um, then you can't adapt to what's around you. So we spend a lot of time, I think, right now kind of identifying what toxic masculinity looks like and feels like and sounds like. I think every week right now there's a new book coming out about it. Um, my hunch is that those of you who work, work with young men and adolescents um, and male clients, um, if you begin to talk about aspects of masculinity, this probably has come up. Um, and I, I think, again, there's this toxic kind of notion, right, which is this kind of more on an extreme. But I'm going to also kind of contrast that with what I call toxin masculinities, right, 
So if the toxic is the kind of extreme piece and this interpersonal piece, this toxin aspect of masculinity is kind of more on a range from kind of being very rigid in terms of kind of you know, traditional masculine ideology to maybe, maybe not as rigid, but this is the kind of aspect around, around being stoic and kind of having a, aggression and not seeking help and feeling this need to be successful. We know that that also has a pretty significant impact on, on men and, and, and men's health. Um, and if we don't begin to understand that toxic masculinity, that's probably what is going to kill most men down the road. Um, the other aspect of this is that as we spend so much time talking about, about toxic masculinity, um, what we're doing is kind of elevating our discussions around, around the bad and the toxic, and it doesn't leave, leave a lot of room for talking about what is healthy, adaptive, and pro-social out there. So this question, again, is there are also positive masculinities? And a fair amount of my own research is actually on positive masculinities, right, which is looking at, at what is healthy masculinity and what's right and how you know it. Um, one of the difficulties, of course, is the majority of, of research has, has kind of looked at negative aspects of it. Um, so I'm going to just move real quickly to a couple other kind of things, which is I think when we begin talking about, about men and, 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 and health, um, you have to have an idea of, of what men's health looks like. Um, and then that helps kind of bring us down to understanding what happens in, in clinical sessions with men. Um, but we do know that despite having greater SES advantages than women, men are at greater risk of serious chronic disease, injury, and death. And men die almost five years earlier than women. And, and these are larger statistics, statistics across populations. What we're pretty aware of is, is the fact that um, um, right now women live to about the age of 81. Men live about the age, age of 76. That disparity has actually been dropping over the past 30 years. It used, used to be seven years difference. Um, what the belief here is that, is that um, it's not that necessarily that that women are getting um, healthier. It's that we think that in some ways the population has hit a ceiling in terms of, of longevity rates. Um, um, we know that for the 15 leading causes of death, men have higher age-adjusted death rates than females in every age group, and the greatest disparity is, is, is found in murder and suicide rate, which is roughly between three to four percent higher depending on on, on the age level. Um, there's also a larger recognition, of course, of the impact of childhood trauma. Um, and again, my hunch is that we see a lot of that right now, um, but we know that certainly Im Im impacts men's health. When we think about, about men's health, we're aware of a few things, is that um, um, when we look at, at that longevity rate, um, we know that biological factors are pretty poor indicators in terms of why that is, is the case. Uh, it's really health beliefs and health behaviors that are, that are more explanatory. And there's a citation listed here, which is called Dying to be Men by, by Will Courtney, which is a really good understanding of, of kind of why it is that, that men, men die sooner. Um, and what Courtney kind of talks about is really, really kind of, kind of six reasons why. And again, these are health behaviors. We know that health behaviors themselves in, in, in men begin to form kind of in, in mid adolescence. Um, so when we're thinking about how we kind of work at health behaviors, a really good intervention point is obviously in high school. Um, we know that men have kind of um, uh, less healthy, healthy lifestyles, um, so that's health-promoting health behavior, so they're more overweight, they eat more meat, fat, and salt, eat less fiber, they are less likely to do self-examination, they sleep less, and they sleep less well, and they're not likely to take time off for illness. We look at risk-taking behavior, we know that men are more likely to use abuse, alcohol, and drugs, more likely to drive drunk, um, have, have more sexual partners, carry guns and weapons. Um, again, I'm just giving you some quick stats. Most of this actually comes from the insurance industry, because <laughs> um, you may wonder kind of why is it that, that, that men might have higher insurance premiums than women, and it has a lot to do with this. If you look at physical abuse and violence, that men are more likely to commit acts of physical abuse and violence, and also more likely to be victims of it as well. Um, you know, that men account for 80% of all, all completed suicides. Um, interestingly enough, around, around social support, we know that men have smaller social networks and fewer friendships, particularly as they get older. Um, they're less likely to have a close confidant, particularly someone other than a spouse, right? So in times of stress, men have difficulty mobilizing some type of, some type of social support around it. Um, 
and our behavioral responses to stress mean that men um, have a greater use of avoidance strategies, um, that they have more overall risk-taking behaviors, and they tend to, tend to deny physical and emotional pain. In this last piece here, we know that men tend to use fewer health care services, and they're not as likely to men as, as women have a, have a regular source of health care. Um, and all of this, of course, leads to this notion, going back to kind of why is it that, that men might die, die, die five years sooner. Um, of course, then we have this connection around kind of, we focus down more about masculinity and, and, and mental health. Um, and I think the important piece kind of here is that, again, it's less of a recognition of the kind of being male, not biology, uh, but our health beliefs and an interaction with those health beliefs and, and, and the environment around there. So all those, simply being male is linked with poor health behaviors, increased health risk, a stronger correlation between gender or one's gender orientation and a male's belief about, um, about being a man and, and, and mental health. So, when we look at this, the question is, is kind of, what does socialization teach men about mental health? And what we find is that, of course, men often learn to externalize blame and impact. Um, so in a therapy session, this is something about kind of why, why are you here? I'm here because someone else has a problem. I'm here because my boss has a problem um, or because uh, my wife has a problem, my partner has a problem, or my kids have a problem. Um, we know that men learn, learn to self-medicate. So men learn, learn, learn to self-medicate through a lot of different ways, um, whether that's, that's through addiction, whether that's through gaming, whether it's through gambling. Um, but they find different ways to help themselves, right? Another notion is that men learn is that anger is what we call a funnel emotion, right? So everything gets kind of funnel, funneled through anger. So sadness or shame or depression comes out as anger. Um, and, and men learn that at a young age um, because it's really the most acceptable emotion. So even in, in therapy or counseling, it's not uncommon that you ask men how they're feeling, what they say is angry. Um, and, and the recommendation, of course, is, is to validate that and recognize that um, let's figure out what's behind, behind that anger. And behind the anger is when you, where you often find more tender emotion. We often learn this notion that men learn that, that an emotional expression does not relieve stress. Um, and that comes again often with terms of how, how boys and girls are, are often socialized to think about emotions. Um, what girls often learn at a young age is that when they, they express a tender emotion, that emotion gets validated back. So again, if a, if, if a girl says, I'm in pain or I'm hurt, the response is, oh, sweetie, that's, that's, I'm so sorry to hear that. Let me give you a hug. Uh, whereas boys may do the exact same thing and be told, well, walk it off. Or, uh, you know, it's not that bad, right? And as we kind of move that through adolescence, you know, what, what society and, and, and kind of culture often do does for girls is validate their experiences around emotions and, and for men it's the opposite. What they often get is shaming. Um, as, we, as we move further into adulthood, um, we often find that, for example, in couples therapy, if, if we have a heterosexual couple, um, most often one of the complaints or concerns is that he doesn't express his emotions. Um, and the female partner may sometimes say something like, you know, you really ought to express emotions. The background piece, of course, that her experience is that when you express emotions, it's good um, because her experience may have been that I've been validated back. On, on the male partner, what he might say is, um, why would I express my emotions? Because when I express my emotions, I don't feel very good. I just feel shame, right? So couples therapy is often around kind of finding safe spaces for men, men to learn to express their emotions and some type of validation. Um, men often learn, learn to silence their, their needs, right? So they may talk about certain things externally, but the internal kind of psychological needs of, of what they want, right? They learn that they're not allowed to ask for them. And this last piece, of course, is the notion that men often learn to, to avoid health care, um, including you. Um, so this next graphic kind of looks at this notion about how men find their way to you. And I, I will say that when we look at the research on men and masculinity and, and psychology, um, what we know for sure is that men are, are less likely to seek psychological help for, for a variety of reasons. And on the left, you can see that there's this notion that we know that, that men experience the stress, right? 
And then this notion is, is what happens, right? So we have what is often called, called avoidance factors and, and approach factors. Um, our, our, our avoidance factors would be things such as, um, I can't get time off work, I don't have, have insurance, I can't, I can't get a bus there, um, I've had a bad experience, or things like stigma, right? I'll, I'll take care of it on my own, I'll go see someone else. Um, we, have, we have approach factors. Um, approach factors would be something like, um, um, I've been to therapy before and it was helpful. I had a friend who went to therapy and it was helpful. Being in an environment in which help seeking is a norm. Um, being told, this is actually a pretty good tip, is that when you do make referrals to people, if you put a personal twist on it um, and say, you know, here's a referral for you, I think he or she would be a really good therapist for you. It's so more likely to follow up on the approach because of, of, of that personal tip, right? Um, but somewhere in here we have this process that, that men experience distress. There's a lot of factors that kind of encourage them not to come see you. And then we, we have to really build on these, on these approach factors, which is this notion in terms of why they will come see you. There is some research that suggests that um, being given the option of kind of talk therapy or other forms of help, such as taking medication, men are more, more likely to prefer talk therapy because um, they see taking medication as a cop-out. Um, but again, what we're looking at is that we're fully aware, again, when those men actually come to see you, right? Um, and then we have an opportunity then to engage them and help them. The concerning report, uh, part of this, of course, is the top, is that what happens to the guys who don't get to you, right? Um, and I can say I have a lot of experiences with men who um, have been in stress for a very long time and never e even thought about going to therapy. And I ask them, how long have you been experiencing depression? And they say 20 years, right? And I'm also um, convinced, of course, is that one of the reasons why we have such a high suicide rate, of course, is that men avoid coming to therapy. And what they learn, again, is that there's no, um, there's no hope. And so, Again, men don't make as many attempts. They, they often, often kind of look to complete in, instead. Um, so the key for you is kind of looking at how do you, how do you address this in session. Um, um, again, being aware that seeking help often conflicts with notions of masculinity for men, right? Because if you seek help, you have to admit that you need help, right? And needing help, again, leads men to kind of notions of vulnerability. A lot of men are uncertain about what actually is distress. There's some research coming out of Australia and other places that when compared to women, you know, men will often kind of underreport symptoms, right, and not see something that is severe as severe. So when they assess kind of, kind of depression on mild, moderate, and severe, most women can go through and say, this is mild, this is moderate, this is severe. A lot of men um, don't see that difference, right, and they confuse mild and moderate as the same, and, they, and, and so... Third thing is that we know that a lot of men might find other outlets before coming to, um, to seek help first, whether that's self-help, they may talk to a friend or a priest or a rabbi. Um, but again, therapy is often not the first thing. Help seeking does often trigger shame, shame and stigma, and you have to be aware of that. So even though they're in your space, you have to be aware that it's a shaming environment for a lot of men. Um, and again, because vulnerability is often not validated by others, a lot of men are looking for it not to be validated by you either. So when I work with men and talk to them the first time, you know, I'm really aware that what I want to do is validate his experiences. This notion about why do men actually come to therapy? Um, what actually brings them in? There's a variety of, of ways. Um, often it's kind of this notion around some type of relational conflict or, or loss. So there might, might be an ultimatum from one's partner. If you don't go to therapy, we're done. Um, often negative affect in some capacity. So, so so depression or anxiety that's now affecting his life in, in a different kind of way. They come to therapy based on some type of, of addiction or crisis, right? Again, there's a Medicaid component that has a negative um, impact on his life. They come to you through, through court-mandated um, routes. They come to you th through kind of PTSD or trauma or like, in, like, like intrusive consequences of that. We find men kind of come to you around kind of existential crises or loss of meaning. So this may be this notion around kind of, this is, I thought my life was, was meant to be a certain way, now it's not, right? So like that, that midlife crisis is not turning 40 and realizing that you need a Porsche, 
know, what the midlife crisis really is, is this notion of a period of reflection, which is, I thought my life was supposed to be a certain way, and maybe it's not. Um, and of course, we have men kind of present around sexuality and sexual identity concerns, right? And kind of, as they begin to kind of figure out kind of who they are, um, they often find their way to you. Um, fully aware that men experience the full range of psychological concerns, right? So we'll go across the DSM. You know, there's certain kind of categories which men are overrepresented, such as kind of addictive disorders and whatnot, but they have the full range of, of concerns. There's a couple ideas here that are a little, a little, I think, kind of hard to hold on to here, but one is that this notion that although men carry power and privilege in society, right, many men do not feel they have access to that power or don't perceive that they do, right? So this notion here is that um, men can go experiences of, of kind of job loss and then, and again, the environment's saying that, you know, you have power and privilege and he's thinking, I don't feel very powerful right now, right? Uh, or I'm feeling like this is not what I, I thought I was going to get, you know, or, or what I, I thought I would achieve in my life. You know that other men hold power and privilege in certain identities, but be marginalized in others, right? So you can have male kind of privilege and have male power at the same time experience other identities in which you don't. We do know that, again, is that as men pursue kind of power and, and success, they often experience pain, powerless, ill health, and isolation, right? So as men kind of look at kind of what it means to be powerful, right, kind of moving towards some of these kind of more traditional ideas, but we also kind of realize is that that has an impact, right? And it comes through that, how you cope with that, right? Maybe through, through addiction, violence, interpersonal conflict, or irritability. And this last piece, again, that often that psychic pain is not obvious to men, right? So when they come into your, your session, they're not really sure why they're there. And I, I can't remember how many times, right? I've talked about it the first time and I can, I kind of say, what, what brings you in? And he says, I'm not really sure. You know, and I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to be doing here. Um, so again, we have to begin to, as the helping professional, really work on engaging them and helping them feel, feel comfortable. Um, men's beliefs about seeking help and kind of being in therapy have a lot to do with, with their social networks and norms. We know that men are less referred to, to these networks. Um, they're less likely to receive support and direction from other men to go seek help. Um, and many kind of male networks themselves don't look at kind of these non-masculine topics like talking about therapy. Um, so I work in a counseling department. So I'm, you know, I work in a place in which going to therapy is quite normal, right? But if I were to walk over to business school, for example, that department would be quite different. Um, so one of the things we're aware of is that if we want to begin to kind of make, make large scale kind of changes, we have to really begin to influence social networks and norms in terms of, of help seeking. Um, there are a lot of things you can do to really help men around this and use this knowledge, which again is you want to welcome men into your spaces. Um, you want to do outreach efforts, right? You want to create what I would call gender neutral or, or kind of masculine sensitive spaces where you operate. And one way of doing that is kind of going through and kind of looking at your, your clinic office or place where you, where you work and saying, you know, if a man came in here, what would he, how would he feel? Would he feel like this is a, this is a place for him? that's actually welcoming him in. I think you want to examine the help seeking process that you encounter and you want to normalize it and actually validate it. So I understand that it's normal for guys not to want to see someone like me, all right? And that's okay, right? Um, I think you also want to normalize help seeking community through, through repeated exposure. So I find that, that um, when I talk to people in my own, own, own social networks, I talk about my experiences of being, being a male therapist, and I talk about men's health as a way to kind of just kind of break down barriers around that. Um, the guiding principles, I would say, when we look at kind of working with men is that, you know, is that men often kind of long for connection, but they often fear it as well. So they, they long to have it, but it's really kind of scary. Um, so don't underestimate their capacity for connection. Um, um, and I think, again, an outcome of that is that anyone has, has worked in men's groups or seen men's groups or been in a, uh, met men who have been in men's groups, you often find that they have figured this part out, right? Um, you know, again, men have the full range of experiences and can explore them, right? So men are not unemotional and men don't have the capacity, um, but often has to do with the context and this willingness to share them with you. So you have to show some patience. 
So again, I kind of work around this dialectic with men, which is I view men as pain and wanting relief, yet at the same time not wanting to be vulnerable. Um, a great resource, I think, is kind of this APA guideline for psychology. Psychological Practice with Boys and Men. This came out last summer. It's a free download. You'll begin to kind of see some kind of, again, a lot that I've talked about here is kind of covered here in a lot more detail. Um, but it's a way to kind of figure out kind of how do we move, move men towards health. So the guidelines themselves, like I've, I've said to other people, is at no point in the guidelines where it talks, talks about toxic masculinity. It's not a term in here, but the term positive masculinity is, right? So this is really kind of a guidance in terms of thinking about how we begin to help men um, live much healthier lives, and also how we as therapists and helping professionals can work our, our, ourself, right, so that we can begin to kind of, kind of engage men in new ways. Um, some of the research in terms of what's actually helpful for men um, is this, is that having some awareness of, of kind of male, male gender socialization and development is really helpful, right, understanding kind of why men might be the way that they are. And again, this comes from understanding men overall, but in asking your, your clients, like, how do they identify? Who are their, some of their models? Um, what does it mean for them to be a man? And then realizing kind of where some of those conflicts may come in and how it impacts their health. Looking at gender issues and assessment is quite critical as well. So we know, for example, that looking at things like men and depression, that we know that men often mask depression. So mask, like a mask you put on your face, is that um, they're taught not to show you these kinds of things, right, from on the external piece, but internally they're experiencing this. So you have to go a little bit deeper. Research suggests that if you talk about gender role socialization with, with men in, in accordance with kind of how they identify themselves, that's quite helpful. Things like small talk and chit-chat and humor and metaphors and stories are often quite helpful. Having a nuanced understanding of men and emotion, like again, earlier, if there's, if there's one thing that I think you can leave here with is that Understanding that shame with men is probably the core emotion to understand. Um, so we talk about anger maybe being what's most expressed. Behind that anger for most men is, is often shame. Um, and, you know, I know we're having a larger conversation nationally about this a little bit. Probably has a lot to do with people like, like Renee Brown talking about this. Um, but for men, you know, shame is the kind of piece is that whether or not they're shamed by other people, men do a good job of actually shaming themselves. Um, and again, for a lot of men, being in therapy is a shaming experience itself. And what you find what they're going to then begin to share is experiences that they've already shamed themselves for, right? So again, having a really nuanced understanding around that, creating a safer space for them to talk about it and, and be patient about it. Um, I'm just going to mention this real quickly, but I, I do think one of the challenges for men, of course, is to kind of build deeper connections, and that can start with you. Um, you know, a challenge for men is learning how to, how to have more egalitarian relationships as society kind of shifts. Um, you know, the key to health, we know, um, is being connected. And a lot of masculine socialization encourages men to disconnect. And we see a lot of kind of, again, some books and research recently talking about men and friendships and kind of how over time men don't have as many friendships, right? So part of what we want to do in therapy, of course, is get men connected in some ways. Um, whether that's to other people in their lives or even in, in their community and getting engaged in, in some good kind of activities that, that feel, help him feel connected to, to, to social welfare that, so that he feels useful. Um, what you see on the outside is not always what's going on, on the inside. We've talked about this earlier, is that men may present as like the thing, um, right? But the reality is that there's something else inside, right? But presenting a strong front takes a lot of energy and effort. Right? And it's a way to maintain control and to get you from not asking questions. <laughs> it keeps other people away and protects against shameful feelings, right? But it has long, long-term consequences. Um, I think it's critical to begin to endorse and begin to explore kind of positive masculinity. Um, and again, what, this is probably a whole different webinar, but, but positive masculinity is kind of looking at those thoughts, feelings, and attributes that are expected of men, right? Um, and and that, that promote kind of interpersonal well-being and social good, right? So, again, not everything that men present with is, is, is toxic or harmful. Um, and what we begin to kind of look at is if we do strength-based work with men, you'll find that men will engage much, much quicker. Um, I'm going to end on this last kind of slide here so we have some kind of questions here. But um, 
I like this because this is kind of my ethos here is that, you know, um, no, we won't, right? There's an, there's an opportunity here right now at this point in history, this time in our lives and our society, which is we're having real conversations about men, masculinity, and health. We have an opportunity not to alienate men and boys. We have an opportunity to kind of bring them in and help them live, live healthy lives. Um, but it's going to take professionals like us to begin to kind of be, be really sensitive to this and work hard. Um, I'm going to kind of look at some questions here now. I think Jason will take over for that. Yeah, thank you so much for such a great presentation. We did get a number of questions in. Um, so I think I'll start with a uh, basic question was, is there an age range when men will seek help from a therapist? Uh, that's, a, that's a really good question. And, um, you know, the, the research that I've seen um, is that when we look at kind of notions of masculinity and we look at kind of this notion of kind of conforming to masculine norms, we know that, you know, as men are kind of figuring out who they are as men, probably the peak for for kind of rigid notions of masculinity tends to be kind of that 18 to 22 range, right? So kind of for some might be college age or being in college, other people kind of being out in the workforce and trying to find their ways. And so in some ways that is a, a point in which, you know, not being in ther therapy, right, they're going to express like, I don't need to be there. Um, but then as they go over time, I've noticed that as men get older and they conform less. So there's a notion that men go through what we call a gender role journey. And the thought about that as a kind of two things. One is that there's certainly a biological component to that, that is as, as men get older and, and testosterone kind of decreases. Uh, and two is that we know that as men get older, they're treated different in society as well. And the expectation of kind of being more rigid is less and, and they're often more, more open to seeking help. So I've noticed that over time, kind of middle-aged kind of periods when men are more likely to seek help. Thank you for that. Yeah, uh, so a few of the questions that came in really centered around uh, creating safe spaces for men. So specifically, yeah. do you have any tips or resources um, for really creating uh, gender neutral or masculine sensitive spaces? Um, yeah, again, that, that, that there's, there's lots of resources on this, and I think the guidelines are a good place to go for that. There's a couple of different books out there and whatnot. But, but what, I, what I would say is that, um, you know, first of all, we don't want to treat all men as stereotypes, right? And so a lot of stuff we've talked about, you know, again, you have to begin to kind of uh, to talk to men about kind of, uh, what kind of man they are, what kind of gender, uh, uh, gender identity that he has, how he sees himself, what he is looking for, and then you adapt to that. What I do find is that working with male clients is often a bit more active. Um, so I'm more willing to be active as a, as a therapist as opposed to reflective. I've noticed that I self-disclose a lot more working with men, particularly at, at the beginning. Um, and often what this is talked about is, is, is what I call the, call the test, which is this notion that as men come in and they look at you, this notion is, you know, I'm engaged as much as you're engaged. <laughs> I'm willing to take a risk. You're willing to take a risk. So mm -hmm. I might find myself sharing aspects of, uh, again, I may not self-disclose completely personal kind of things, but I may say, you know, there's a period in my life where I also realized I had those challenges as well. Um, so I'm trying to validate this experience so we realize that someone else might understand it. Um, and also a fair amount of, of what, I, what I said earlier is chit-chat and, and, and kind of jokes and male humor, that a lot of men use humor to say very serious things. Um, and after telling jokes, you're not not doing therapy. You're engaging and building relationships, right? And so um, use chit-chat. Listen to what he kind of says. With, with boys and adolescents, understand their interests and follow up on them. And you might find, again, that what the therapy actually feels a bit more personal in many ways. And, again, particular cultures as well, that's quite common. Um, but there's a per, more, more personal notion of therapy um, initially to, to, to try and engage around that. The other thing I think is helpful tip, which is um, really figure out up front what, he, what, what is helpful for him. Um, so you, you may assess some other types of things as being maybe being a presenting problem or concern, but if you don't work on what he finds useful, he may not come back. Awesome. Thank you. Unfortunately, we are out of time uh, for questions. I will say that, um, Dr. Angela Carson, if you do have time to answer a few of these questions, I'd love to collect them and uh, just get your feedback on them at a later date. Um, I'm more than happy. Yeah. 
Awesome. So with that, I do want to thank you all for attending the webinar. Uh, Dr. Angela Carson, again, thank you so much for a great presentation. Uh, it's much appreciated. I appreciate it being here. And again, people can contact me directly if they have questions too. I'm happy to, to talk about them. Awesome. And with that, everyone, I do want to uh, let you know of a few events that we have upcoming. Um, so Caring for Families Impacted by Substance Use Disorder, that is on May 29th at 12.30 p.m. And also Empowering Recovery and Resilience with Mindfulness on Thursday, May 30th at 12 p.m. As always, please go to our website, CTAC, um, sorry, it's uh, ctac.ny.org, ctacny.org, sorry, I should know that. Um, and check out our offerings, register for any upcoming events. And again, thank you for joining us for this webinar, and we will see you next time. Take care.